It wasn't long ago that a cutting torch was almost the only way to cut metal in most fabrication shops. Now since then, with the advent of plasma cutters and, you know, carborundum wheels and the band saws that most people can afford, there are other ways to cut metal. But a cutting torch is perhaps the most versatile of all the tools that exist for the purpose of cutting metal. I want to talk about cutting torches, what they are, how they work, and how to use them. But I want to tell you right now, this is an entry level sort of description of the process and the, the tool. There is a lot more that can be said about cutting torches and cutting metal than I know. So what I'm going to share with you is what I know about how to use it for general purpose in a fabrication shop safely and hopefully effectively. First thing to talk about is the bottles, because when you're understanding the cutting torch, you have to understand the risks and the benefits of, that these bottles bring to the table. Let's talk about the oxygen first. These, are, these bottles are heavy. I mean, they are heavy because they're withstanding a lot of pressure. That means you do not ever want it to be penetrated. If it's shot, you got a problem. But the more likely thing is you don't want it to tip over. If this tipped over and that valve hit the edge of that table and broke the neck off this bottle, visualize a 200 pound balloon being let go it will launch. There are horrifying videos on YouTube about what it looks like when an, when an oxygen bottle gets the neck knocked off of it. It takes a long time to stop and it will go through anything, I mean anything, before it does come to a stop. So item one, protect the bottles from falling over and if you're transporting them, make sure that the valve is off and the safety cap is on. The acetylene bottle, not near as much pressure, but it, it contains gas that is flammable enough and there's enough of it to blow up just about anything that it leaked into. So you have to be sure all the time that the bottle's off and if it is off you're always monitoring all of the all of the um, joints, all of the connections for leaks. If you smell acetylene which smells different than natural gas, it doesn't have to be odorized like natural gas because it has its own distinctive scent, shut things down because you do not want acetylene leaking into your workspace while you are doing all the other things that happen in a fabrication shop. So control leaks, and if you're transporting this, do not put it in an enclosed environment. Do not put it in your trunk. And put the safety cap on it every time. In my shop, these bottles live on the cart. And that's great about 99% of the time because I always make sure that the cart is leaning up against or is secured to something that is bulletproof and nothing is ever going to make it tip over for any reason. So here's two things. The valves are always off when you're not using them. So when you walk up to the tank to use it, you turn the oxygen on all the, well, not all the way, but three or four turns. You don't back it all the way out to the end of the threads, but you turn it on. And then you turn your regulator up until the valve with the big numbers shows about 20 pounds. Now the gauge with the small numbers is indicating what percent full the bottle is. It gives you an idea of how much oxygen you got left. But the, the gauge with the large numbers that responds to turning in the regulator is telling you how many pounds of pressure you're getting out of your oxygen line. And for general use, you want 20. Now the acetylene bottle is a completely different animal. I don't turn it on all the way. I turn it on about a quarter of a turn maybe a half. And the pressure is turned up at the regulator until it reads about 7 psi for normal cutting. You will learn to adjust these pressures up and down a little bit depending on what you're doing with the torch. But 20 on the oxygen, 7 on the acetylene is a good place to start. Now once you've set the pressures with the, the gas in the line static, you may want to check them again once you're actually lighting the torch because with the gas flowing you may need to turn the regulator up just a little higher to sustain the pressure that you had them set at when you set your, your setup originally. Now that varies you know regulator by regulator and torch by torch but in general once you're burning go back and check and make sure you've got 20 and 7. This is a cutting torch. It consists of a torch body and the cutting tip. There are two valves to the torch body and two valves to the cutting tip. Let's go to the cutting torch itself and the lighting sequence. We've got four valves, three gate valves, I think, and a squeeze valve. The first thing you do is turn 
this oxygen gate valve, the one closest to the bottle, on essentially all the way, several turns, wide open. The next thing you do is crack the acetylene just a little. Now we have some acetylene coming out of the tip and no oxygen yet. That's an acetylene flame with no added oxygen except what it's getting from the air. This oxygen valve is open, and so now we crack this oxygen valve just a little. And open it until that white feather disappears. See that? That is pretty much a neutral flame. We'll talk about what that means in a minute. But the last step in lighting this torch is to squeeze this valve and then open the oxygen until the last of those white feathers is gone. That's how you light your torch. To shut it off is the reverse sequence. You close this valve, there's an acetylene flame with no added oxygen, and then shut off the acetylene or fuel. Now let me show you what happens when you do not shut it off in that sequence. Remember, this is on, I crack this valve, it's lit, I turn that on, I hit the lever, I give it a little more, and if I shut off the acetylene, did you hear that little snick? Sometimes it's a pop. Sometimes it will pop when you shut the fuel off first, and that creates some pressure and pushes soot back up into the tip, and it's not good. So you always just reverse the sequence, oxygen off, first, acetylene off, second. I'm going to give you a little more sort of global information on cutting itself, and in a future time we'll give you more specifics on different metals and pressures. But for now, here's what you need to know. Maximum temperature is at the tips of those little six white cones. There are six little bitty holes around the big hole that's in the middle, and your maximum temperature is at the tips of those cones not pushing those cones into the work, not holding back a half an inch, but at the tips. You tip the torch so it's pointing in the direction that you're traveling. But you do not begin to move until you have a molten pool that you can see on the surface. Now you've got to think about what's happening. You have six little bitty independent jets around the circumference, each of them super hot, each of them almost touching the metal. As each of those little jets begins to melt its own little spot of the, of the steel, in a, just a matter of seconds or less, those spots grow until the whole area, about the size of the tip of the torch, is suddenly bright yellow and liquid. That's the moment that you squeeze the lever and begin to move slowly forward as soon as that molten pool has blown through the bottom of the piece you're cutting. You don't begin to move until the entire area is molten, the lever is hit, and you can see, probably through your peripheral vision, or perhaps looking down into the top of the pool, that the jet of oxygen has actually pushed the molten steel straight through the piece and out the bottom. At that point, it's just moved steadily and slowly and smoothly forward, maintaining the right distance above the work, maintaining the right angle relative to the work, and moving forward at the right speed. There's nothing to it. Cutting steel with a cutting torch is one place that you darn sure better be protecting your eyes. I mean, at the moment of hitting that pool with the blast of, of oxygen, molten steel can come straight back up into your face, so your eyes have to be protected. Now, the ultraviolet radiation that comes from a cutting torch is not near as intense and in fact, I would almost argue that it, there is none, but I won't stake out that ground, but it's not the same as arc welding. So it's not gonna give you sunburns, it'll just give you blisters, I mean, if the steel gets on you, and it's not going to blind you like an arc weld will if you stare at it. But you can see what you're doing better if you have some sort of a, some sort of a filter, just helps your ability to keep track of what you're doing if it's not too dark. Now I can use this, I mean, it doesn't get, I mean, that's going to protect me, right? But it's not going to make it easier to see the work. If you have a speed glass type of uh, welding helmet with a grind setting so that it's not flashing full dark, put it on. Put it on grind. It's slightly tinted. You can see well. You're well protected. So bottom line is, 
you know, you're a grown-up. Let's assume you're a grown-up. You better take responsibility for your vision when you're using a cutting torch because it's one of those tools in the shop that can easily and permanently put out an eye. There's a world of information that I haven't dumped on you yet. A lot of it I don't even have. That the fuel line is left-hand threads. That you never oil the regulators. And on and on and on. Tip sizes and cleaning, but we're not worried about that now because it's time for you to pick up that torch and cut some steel. It's the way you're going to learn to do this. And the learning curve is steep for a short period of time and then gradual for the rest of your life. So if you just pick up that torch and uh, start cutting some metal, start getting some little burns on your hands, start thinking about what's happening as you're traveling along and how you can keep the distance uniform as you move forward, before you know it, you'll have no trouble cutting out shapes, making parts, cutting the bolt heads off that are stuck, just doing a wide variety of things that can only be done in most shops with a cutting torch. Now when a saw stops cutting smoothly, it usually needs to be sharpened. And when a cutting torch stops cutting smoothly, you might need to clean out the jets of the torch tip itself. Get a tip cleaner and very carefully remove the soot and the dirt and the bits of melted metal that build up inside those tiny holes using these tiny files. Now don't make the holes bigger. Don't force a file in there that just doesn't want to go because you want to just clean out the holes. Don't increase the diameter and try to not let the filings and bits of debris fall back into the tip. Now just like everything else, these tips are going to wear out. So if you're new to this game and you're working with an old used torch, a new tip might be a big help. You know, it was difficult for us to get a nice clean shot of the actual fire itself. The cones of the neutral flame and the acetylene feather that I mentioned when we were lighting the torch. And I didn't even bring up in this video the difference between a carburizing flame and an oxidizing flame. We'll save that for another video. So for now, you're going to see what I mean about the different parts of the flame when you light it. It's the little cones that indicate neutral combustion. They're in the deepest part of the flame, one at each of the six jets around the circumference of the torch. They're right up against the tip itself and they are actually white in color. When you increase and decrease the oxygen you're going to see them change shape right in front of you and the torch is ready to cut the moment that the acetylene feather disappears as you are increasing the oxygen flow through the lever valve. Don't sweat this. You're going to know it when you see it. You're going to figure this out. Thanks for watching and keep up the good work.